It is now my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Roxy Senior, MD, DM, FRCP, FESE, FACC, FASE, Professor of Clinical Cardiology, NHLI, Imperial College, and Royal Brompton Hospital, London. Dr. Senior. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so first of all, uh, uh, let me give you a short overview of International uh, Contrast Ultrasound Society, which is ICUS. Uh, this is actually the only uh, international professional society which is solely dedicated in focusing on contrast enhanced ultrasound. Uh, and uh, it provides uh, free membership free webinars, free weekly news monitor, and free point of care uh, CU um, uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound app and a comprehensive website with free access to case of the day challenges, sonographer resources, bubble blogs, reimbursement guidelines, and then uh, practice guidelines. Um, so it makes a lot of sense those who, those who are interested in contrast enhanced ultrasound to be a member of ICUS, uh, more so because it already provides membership to 60 countries. There, there are members from 60 countries uh, amongst physicians, sonographers, nurses, scientists, industry, and patients. And it is across the board of various speciality like radiology, cardiology, hepatology, vascular, and GI medicine. So with this, uh, I will move on to quickly, uh, um, you know, dis not discuss really, just an overview of the agenda today. So um, the first talk will be by me, uh, talking on guidelines for assessment of cardiac structure and function. And then Tom Porter will be talking on guidelines for assessment of perfusion, and then some limitations, and then followed by question answer, and then conclude. So these are my disclosure, and I'll move on to my talk. So first of all, what is uh, a contrast or ultrasound enhanced echocardiography? Uh, this is uh, something that is done with an agent called microbubble, which is a microsphere consisting of high molecular weight gas, which could be sulfur, uh, sulfur fluoride, perfluoropropane, and, uh, and surrounded by a shell. Now the gas and the shell actually maintains the integrity of the bubble so that when it is injected intravenously, uh, it remains stable throughout the circulation, passing through the pulmonary circulation because the size of the bubbles are such that it is very small. It is about the size of a red blood cell, as you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, these are the capillaries through which the microbials are moving along with the red blood cell. And, uh, and when injected intravenously, not only you can assess the cardiac structure and function, but also myocardial perfusion. And as you can see here, there are various products available uh, depending upon, and, and they have different components of gas and shell. So Sonoview uh, or Lumason in US, Luminity, or definitely in US and Optison. So before we go on further, so we are going to talk mainly how the guidelines influence uh, our uh, um, essentially day-to-day -day practice. So the, the very first recent guidelines has been the ESCBI guideline from uh, Europe 2017, and then quickly followed by American Society of Echo guidelines in 2018. And now we have an, uh, this, uh, the amalgamation of both, both these guidelines into one document, which primarily focuses on cardiac exam protocol. This is the ICAS guideline that is published uh, very recently, about two months ago, uh, uh, with Tom leading the publication, Tom Porter. So, so moving on. What does the ICAS guideline actually say? So this, has, as I said, is mainly focused on uh, protocols and cardiac examination. So it, it talks on in, about instrumentation and settings that is required, indications, and I will give some examples of the indication, 
and optimizing images with respect to doses and instrument setting. So first of all, I will move on to actually go a little bit into the physics of contrast agent because uh, we'll be talking uh, uh, quite a lot about different types of imaging. So first of all, we will be talking about fundamental imaging and harmonic imaging. So what is fundamental imaging? This is nothing but uh, imaging with a transducer, which uh, emanates and receives the same frequency. So meaning the objects that are struck by the uh, emanating ultrasound uh, 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 field a response with the same frequency. And so this is uh, called fundamental imaging. So it responds in the fundamental imaging mode. And this is true for the tissues and for the microbubbles and the surrounding structures and even the noise. The noise also produces a lot of fundamental frequencies. Uh, then what is harmonic imaging? Again, it is nothing but a transducer which gives off uh, a certain frequency, in this case, three megahertz, and receives at multiples of the same frequency, which in this case is six megahertz. And again, this response, harmonic response, uh, 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 the tissues respond this way, the microbubbles also do so. So if the microbubbles in the tissue respond this more or less similar way to both fundamental and harmonic imaging, so how do we actually image the microbubbles? Now, if you note in this uh, 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 video, you can see when the ultrasound strikes the microbubble, it becomes small, but expands exponentially. And as a result of this, when you look at the microbubbles, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, ultrasound wave that hits the microbubbles, and then when it receives it, it receives the waves which are quite different from what it the, uh, the, the quality of the wave, wave with which it strikes. So this is called non-linear response. However, if you look at the way the tissue behaves, now you can see this is a, a incident wave and that's the wave returning from the tissue is exactly the same. So this is linear response. So though both microbubbles and tissue give off uh, fundamental and harmonic imaging, but the quality of microbubble response is different from that of tissue. And that, uh, and the different waveform that microbubble produces is the signature of a microbubble. And that's what the transducers can actually detect. So not only you need to know what I've just said, but also the relationship between the transmit power, meaning the ultrasound field in which, uh, uh, you know, the way, the ultrasound actually strikes the microbubble with the power. The power is expressed as mechanical index and mechanical index is nothing but the negative pressure that it uh, imparts on the objects in the field divided by the square root of the frequency and it essentially expresses the energy with which it strikes the microbubble. So, and the behavior of the microbubble and the tissue uh, under you know, increasing mechanical index are different. So for example, the normal mechanical index that we image patients with without any ultrasound enhancing agent is more than one. As you can see in the right-hand side is 1.2. Uh, so if we try to image uh, the heart with that frequency, see how the microbubble responds now. So this is the microbubble responding so you can see the microbubble is being hit and it is reverberating, becoming large and then it bursts and then it goes away. And if you try to image in this mode in real time, you can see that you can see lots of microbubbles, but it doesn't last, it disappears. And you can see the tissue very well here. So there's a lot of tissue harmonics and lots of large signals from the microbubbles, but the microbubbles are getting destroyed. So you cannot look at it in real time. So that is why, we need to image the microbubble at the lowest mechanical index possible. So, so the presets that we have in our machine are called LVO, left ventricular opacification preset, which is uh, a mechanical index between 0 0.5 to 0 0.2. Now at that frequency, uh, at that, so, sorry, mechanical in, uh, index, a uh, lot of harmonics are being produced by microbubbles and also by the tissue. And this is how the image looks like. If you image with, you know, with uh, LVO setting, 
Now it's a great image. You can see the microbials very clearly. You can see the endocardium very nicely. But what you also note is there's a microbial destruction at the apex. And also you will note that the far field is not that clearly seen with harmonics. The harmonics don't penetrate a lot in, a, you know, in, a, uh, in the field. And therefore, if the patient is a bit big, then the attenuation will be much, much larger uh, behind, the, uh, um, uh, behind the left ventricle. And also there's destruction of the microbial. So though it is good, but it's not ideal. And of course, you can't see anything in the myocardium Meaning, as you know, the myocardium is well perfused, but you can't see any microbials, though there is blood vessels there, because the microbials are getting destroyed at that point. So if we go further down to uh, less than 0 0.2, it is, it is, this preset is known as very low mechanical index, uh, uh, very low MI imaging. Now here, the harmonics become weak from the microbials and also from the tissue, as you can see in this video. So we've, we've just reduced the mechanical index down to 0 0.12 with the same LBO setting, but you can see, and this is a harmonic imaging, as you can see, it, it emanates that uh, it gives off a frequency of 1.3 and receives at 2.6, but it looks rather a washed out, you know, um, uh, image, a weak signals from the microbials, weak signals from the uh, tissue. But the, but the harmonics may be weak, but look at the fundamental, you know, the fundamental frequency is very strong here, both from the microbubble and from the tissue. So using this low mechanical index, if you use harmonics, it's not going to work, but if you use fundamental, it's going to work. But the only problem is both the tissue, the tissue also provides a lot of fundamental frequencies here. So we now we need to suppress the strong signal from the tissue in order for, for the microbials to be seen. And if we can suppress that, and this is what it shows, you know, this is the image that happens when you suppress the, uh, the tissue signals. And now you can see very nicely a uniform LV opacification. You can see microbials within the myocardium. So that's perfusion. And you don't see much attenuation because with fundamental imaging, you don't produce attenuation behind the left ventricle. So it is a perfect image that you can obtain with very low MI. But how do we get rid of the tissue? It is called multipulse cancellation technique. And one of the techniques is called power modulation, whereby a transducer gives off a full, so it's a multipulse. So the first pulse is a full you know, amplitude signal. Um, it, 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 hits the mic, uh, it hits the tissue. So let's look at the tissue. And the tissue reflects exactly at that amplitude. Now it sends off the second pulse is half the amplitude of the first one, but when it receives, it receives at twice the amplitude. So these two then cancel each other because they're all linear response. They cancel out and you don't see any tissue. Whereas if, if the incident ray hits the mi micro bubbles, you can see that the returning signal is different from that of the tissue meaning this is nonlinear. And even if you scale it up to twice, you do not exactly cancel it out because they're both receiving at different amplitudes and different shape, as a result of which we are still left with a signal and that's the microbubble signal. So this is how, this is one of the cancellation modes that I'm ju I've just described, but essentially to give you an idea of how it is done. So, so and that is the recommendation by all the guidelines that we should be using very low MI that is less than 0 0.2 contrast specific imaging mode. There's a lot of other things that go on with this low MI contrast specific imaging mode besides the cancellation. There are other technicalities that come in and that's why the images are so crisp and you can see it's uniformly opacified. You can see the micro levels in the myocardium and, uh, and you get a great tissue cancellation, good signal to noise ratio, and you use lower amount of contrast because the contrast is not destroyed. And as I've said, you can also see the microbial. So this is a preferred um, method to image the microbubbles. However, there are cases where you really want to see the tissue also pretty well. For example, trabeculations like in non-compaction, 
There we would suggest, the guidelines do suggest that you can go to this LVO mode, higher MI, because the tissue, you want to see the tissue and the tissues give off harmonics. And you can uh, use this uh, LVO mode to look at it. For example, in this case, this is harmonic imaging. And now you can see very nicely, not only the micro bubbles, but also the trabeculations within it. And this is an example of a non-compacted uh, left ventricle. So moving on. Uh, so according to all the three guidelines, this is a summary of the you know, use of this technique in, in clinical cardiology. And this is mainly, I'm really just going to focus on cardiac structure and function. My colleague, uh, Tom, will be focusing on um, uh, micro, uh, microvascular perfusion or myocardial perfusion. So you can see it, it, it is used to improve endocardial body delineation for regional wall motion and for, you know, for the detection of coronary disease and cardiomyopathies for enhancing Doppler signals, for example, looking at pulmonary artery pressure, tricuspid jets, et cetera, generating left ventricular opacification to quantify volumes and ejection fraction, and generating cardiac chamber and vascular opacification for intracardiac thrombi assessment, masses, dissecting aneurysm, carotid artery disease. So let me quickly show you some example and how it actually changes management. So this is a patient who presented with heart failure. Now, as you know, the management of heart failure will depend on whether the ejection fraction is normal or low. Uh, and as you can see here, this image, you know, you can conjecture whether the LV ejection fraction is normal or not. And it's very difficult to say whether it's normal or abnormal because you actually you can't see the endocardium at all. You just see an outline. Uh, but looking at it, I know many of my colleagues said the ejection fraction looks pretty low. And this is the contrast coming in of the same patient. And we can see it has dramatically changed the, uh, you know, the image quality. And you can now clearly see the endocardium. And the patient has a normal ejection fraction. And this patient was treated as a normal ejection fraction uh, heart failure patients. So now moving on. There's another patient now. This time, this is a 65-year-old patient with, in class three heart failure and is on optimal medical therapy. Here, it's not a question of whether the ejection fraction is low or not because it's clearly low. You can see part of the endocardium, but what is important is whether the ejection fraction is less than 35%. And if it is so, and if the QRS is prolonged, this patient will uh, benefit from ICD because the patient is on optimal medical therapy. Now, even if it is not, the patient will benefit from, uh, sorry, in the first case, it was CRT. In the second uh, case, even if it is not prolonged, the patient will benefit from ICD for prevention of sudden death. So we need to now know exactly what the ejection fraction is. So this is the contrast being injected and the, you can see very clearly the endocardium throughout the LV in the, the sport chamber view. And this patient has an ejection fraction of 42%. So again, the management, uh, so the patient did not get an ICD. Uh, the CRT is not in question because the QRS was normal. Now, it is not only important to actually make an accurate diagnosis, but also to see that the results are reproducible. And this is a multi-center study published in 2005, where several imaging techniques are used, unenhanced echo, senior ventricography, MRI, and contrast-enhanced echo. And here they looked at variability, mean percentage of error. The greater the error, the worse the reproducibility. So you can see that in, with unenhanced echo, the reproducibility you know, is like 13%. Now with senior ventriculography, it is about 9%. With MRI, it's about 7%, while with contrast enhanced echo, it is 4%. So essentially it is exceedingly good uh, reproducible um, uh, method uh, to assess uh, cardiac function. So now this is another example of another patient who presented with chest pain in the uh, 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 ER. Now there's wall, there apparently is a wall motion abnormality, but it's not very clearly seen. But if you look at the image here, there is no wall motion abnormality and contrast was injected. And therefore this patient did not have a, a troponin rise this patient had minor ECG changes and no wall motion abnormality. So he was not considered for any uh, emergency uh, angiography at that point. So 
uh, again, uh, this also high, this study is also a multi-centered study which highlights the importance of giving contrast if you don't see the walls well, at least two of the seg uh, segments, contiguous segments. And you can see here that the diagnosis of regional wall motion abnormality uh, by contrast enhanced echocardiography is one of uh, uh, is one of the most accurate method compared to MRI, which is 84.9. Contrast enhanced echo is 88%. So, so it, it is very important to use contrast when you're not sure and, not, and you're not clear about the endocardium. Uh, and you, see, you can see it makes a big difference in the outcome of the patient. Now, also the other, other point to uh, score is that if you see a LV, which apparently looks, you know, it's a great image, you know, it's, uh, the LV is dilated and uh, it's severely hypokinetic. There's no question about that. But if you have to really assess the LV volume, even here, you, we will struggle because there's a lot of trabeculation here. And we are not sure where the endocardium is. And therefore, if you try to put regions of interest and try to draw it around, you won't know where, where to put it because you need to put your um, cursor uh, when measuring ejection fraction at the compacted myocardium. And that is, uh, you know, and, and that is in the guidelines. So now when contrast is injected, you can see immediately those trabeculation and you can see those compacted myocardium very nicely here. And you can now assess the LV volume much more of, uh, you know, um, accurately. And this is a study which looks at uh, uh, patients with, who underwent MRI, uh, uh, echocardiography and contrast enhanced echocardiography. And they looked at the difference between MRI and echo in terms of volumes and ejection fraction. And you can see it doesn't matter whether the image quality is good or bad, actually in both, if you try to really, if you really want to accurately assess the volume, you need to use contrast because if you consider MRI as the standard, then the difference of volume with MRI is much less with contrast versus without contrast in both with poor image quality and good image quality. And you can see, look at the end systolic volume difference is only nine ml, while with baseline, even in good image quality is about 21. And this does have impact on outcome. And this is a study that we did in 100, nearly 100 patients, 95 patients, where contrast was given and we followed these patients up uh, for mortality. And we found that though clinical factors obviously predicted mortality, uh, and even uh, uh, unenhanced echocardiography predicted mortality, but contrast enhanced was significantly better in predicting mortality than unenhanced echocardiography in, uh, when assessing end systolic volume. And that really drive home the, uh, drives home the point that if you really want to assess volume, give, con uh, give ultrasound enhancing agent. So now quickly moving on, uh, this is another example of a patient who had a previous myocardial infarction. And we can see there's a lot of echoes here. And obviously because of wall motion abnormality, there's a big suspicion whether there's a thrombus or not. Uh, so, but it's not very clear whether there's a thrombus, it could be trabeculation. And even if the thrombus, what is the extent of the thrombus? Because remember, even if you diagnose thrombus, you need to know where it is in order to follow it up subsequently after giving anticoagulation. Now, when we injected contrast, you can now clearly see that the thrombus is actually quite confined to anteroceptal region, whereas in the unenhanced view, it looked like it's right across the apex. So, so now this patient was anticoagulated and we followed this patient up with contrast all the time, because remember, if you did not give contrast, then this patient will seemingly have, have a thrombus all the time. So now, so the other use of uh, echocardiography or uh, contrast echocardiography is to actually characterize the mass. So here is a patient and this is low MI imaging. You can see nice perfusion everywhere in the myocardium, but not in the apex. Clearly it is infarcted and there's a mass and that is, that is not, it is avascular and taking everything into account, it, it is a thrombus. However, here also you can see that is severely hypokinetic LV, and this is a mass, but this mass is, vascu is a vascular mass. You can see all the you know, arterioles here. You can see the flash coming up, destroying the microbials, and, and then it's filling again. So these are all arterioles there. 
So very vascular, and this is likely to be a malignant mass. So it's an excellent way of distinguishing malignant mass uh, or diagnosing malignant mass. If it's vascular, it is highly likely to be malignant. And then uh, moving on, this is a fascinating case uh, uh, with this patient underwent, as you can see, a trans catheter, uh, a trans apical mitral valve implantation for, uh, after a mitral valve repair has failed. This is an Edwards valve inserted upside down uh, through the apex. Now, following that, the patient came back eight weeks later with swelling on the chest. The MRI showed there's some accumulation around the heart. The CT also showed an, you know, some uh, mass around the heart, but it was not sure what it is about. So now this is the echo. You can clearly see there's something, uh, you know, uh, echo-free space here. And this is a, a, a Doppler, not much, you know, some maybe, you know, you can't make out what's going on. Now, this is the contrast image. Now, we've given contrast, low MI imaging. You can see here, it's LB is opacified. And now just watch what happens uh, in the apex. So as you watch with time, you can see this part is gradually filling up with microbubbles. You can see the microbubbles traveling. It's gradually filling up. And right towards the end, you can see it's a lot of microbubbles in this region. So there's a leak through the apex into the space there. And this patient initially, what we, they thought that they would have to go in and you know, do some suturing. But then the first, uh, I think the first thing is to treat this non-invasively. So just a, a lot of compression bandage was applied to the chest and that really worked because subsequently there was no more leak from the, uh, from the, you know, from the LV into that area. And in fact, that area disappeared. It, uh, it, it no longer existed after that. So, so now this is another case, um, uh, uh, just 66 year old female with chest pain radiated to the back, suspected aortic pathology. And we did a, 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 you know, a suprasternal ultrasound and you can see there's something not quite right uh, on, you know, on the arch of the aorta here. And that's the color flow doesn't say very much, but there is something out, outside the uh, arch of the aorta. So a CT scan was done and the CT scan suggested that there could be a mass lying outside the aorta. Now, what we did is we brought the patient back and said, no, let's, let's look at it, you know, with contrast because we suspect there's something else going on there. So we injected contrast and now you can clearly see it's a rupture aorta with a pseudo aneurysm here. You can see the, um, uh, the covering around this aneurysm here. It's all full of maybe fibrine about to burst. Now they were uh, following the CT scan. They even thought of biopsying that mass outside the aorta, but this scan said, no, you can't be doing that, it's dangerous. So they redid the CT scan and tried to locate it. And now they also came up with this diagnosis. Yeah, it's likely to be a pseudo aneurysm. Then that's how the patient was subsequently treated. So it made a lot of difference in how we manage patient. And, and also uh, uh, with contrast enhanced uh, ultrasound, we can look at atrial appendage thrombus uh, during TOE. You can see a thrombus is suspected. And you can see very nicely that there's a big, you know, echo-free space here after contrast injection. But in this particular case, also we were not, they were not sure about the thrombus. And now you can see it's filling the appendage up very, very nicely. And there's no thrombus. So, uh, so, uh, so this is an excellent prospective study uh, done a few years back, a decade ago, which clearly showed the benefit of contrast echo, as have shown you some of the cases. And this just you know, highlights uh, the, uh, the cases that I have shown, that they've, they've shown that it's a prospective study where they've shown that when you give contrast, you change management of the patient in 35% of the time, you know, procedure being avoided, medications change, both medications for procedure changed, et cetera. And, and also there's a cost benefit, about $122 per patient uh, as a result of that. So now moving on very quickly. Um, so now how do we, so these are all the benefits of giving contrast. And we talked about very low MI mechanical index should be the way to uh, image. And the question is, what is the dose and how you should be giving it? So for some of you, the dose, um, sorry, the mechanical index is usually 0 0.2 anyway, but with some of you on definitely, 
It can be low as 0 0.1. With Optison, you may go up a little bit more to 0 0.15, but they're all very low mechanical index imaging, contrast-specific imaging. Now, we can give bolus, we can give infusion. So you can give bolus a very small dose. You can see only 0.4 ml of Sonoview, 0.3 to 0.5 ml of Optison, or only 0.2 ml of Definity, followed by slow injection of 5 ml of normal saline over 10 seconds. Now, with bolus, you know, there's a problem that could, if you give it very fast, there will be attenuation. If we give it very slow, there'll be contrast, you know, there'll be swelling in the apex. I'll show you some examples. And, and as you know, with bolus, uh, it comes in very quickly and goes away very quickly. So it's, uh, it's of short duration, but the test can be done pretty quickly with bolus if it's done properly. Uh, if, if there is a problem with them, then you can go on doing uh, with uh, and infuse the contrast agent. And with Sonoview, the dose would be in the region of 0.7 to 1.2 ml per minute. Uh, with 3% definity, it will be 3 to 5 ml per minute. Or, or, or same with Optison, 10% uh, Optison is the same dose. And you can adjust the dose. I'll come to that, how you do it. So to optimize so, uh, the image, for example, in the four chamber view, start the acquisition after 20 seconds of contrast injection, and then ensure that it's uniformly opacified and if it is not, then you can give a bit more of the bolus or increase the infusion rate. Uh, but if you have given a lot, if you oversaturate it, then you need to get rid of the contrast by you know, flashing with high mechanical index frames or destroying the microbials even with color flow. So I'll show you an example. So this is a patient who has been injected with contrast. Now you can observe that as the contrast was coming in, let's start again right nicely opacified i'll just pause here you can see very nicely opacified there's no attenuation at the back and you should be imaging uh a left atrium also to some extent in order for you to know that you have actually achieved the right opacification so from apex to base it's uniform there's no contrast destruction and also the focus should be kept at the mitral valve level because you want to image the whole of the left ventricle and therefore the focus should be here. And, uh, and you see a little bit of contrast. So this is low MI imaging coming into the myocardium. And this is important because you also, you want to see the LV wall thickening. And there you can see the thickening very well. And, but see, as you wait longer and maybe somebody was injecting a bit more, you can see it's becoming uh, a bit oversaturated towards the end. That's what you should avoid. So it's, coming in, coming in, and now it's, you can see the perfusion, and now it's a bit more than you should be giving it because now there's a bit of attenuation. So you shouldn't go that far, and then otherwise you'll get, you know, you'll get this image here with a lot of attenuation. And so, so there'll be a lot of attenuation if you give the contrast, you know, very fast. So bolus injection should be given very slowly. If you give it fast, you will cause this huge amount of attenuation, a block sitting in the apex, and therefore you have to just wait till it disappears. The best thing to overcome this is really to give a slow injection of bolus, as in this case, you will not, you will not get any attenuation and always do it do uh, very low MI imaging. See, the, the good thing about very low MI imaging also is that you have to alter very little the, uh, the settings because you almost always get a very nice uh, LV opacification. The contrast is not destroyed, it's more uniform and the artifacts are less. But with uh, intermediate or with the low MI imaging, LBO imaging, you do get a lot of artifacts because you have to be really, really careful how you inject. And for example, here, now this is of course with low MI, but there's a, it was given very fast and the gains were too high. So this is blooming artifact everywhere. So this is really a very bad image quality of contrast being given. Now, this is an example of swirling. So here, what's happened is you can see the opacification is not great. There's not enough contrast being given. So you need to give more contrast here. Or the mechanical index is too high. You have to reduce it. So this is actually low MI. This is not actually low MI imaging. This is LVO imaging. And you can see the contrast destruction. So you, you need to go down to LVO imaging. And, uh, and sometimes with severe LV dysfunction, also you may see the swirling and there also you take, um, you can also move the focus up there because when you take the focus up there, you narrow the beam, you don't destroy the contrast and you see a nice opacification there. 
So now this is an example of overcoming it. So this is a low MI imaging. So decrease the mechanical index uh, or increase the contrast dose or move the focus away. All this will help in reducing the swirling. So now to summarize, so all commercially available products are suitable for LB structure and function assessment. Very low MI contrast specific mode recommended with low dosage of uh, ultrasound imaging agent. Now, optimum, what's an optimum image? Uniformly good opacification, no attenuation or apical swelling or blooming. And you see a little bit of contrast in the myocardium to look at epicardium and therefore wall thickening. Uh, bolus is fine, you can give bolus, but, uh, and it is quick. You know, you can, it's a quick examination, but may lead to attenuation if you give too fast. Infusion is, is great, but with infusion, it is more prolonged. The examination could be more prolonged. You give more contrast. Uh, however, there's less chance of attenuation. So it's fine. You can choose either you, uh, uh, of the technique. Uh, but Tom will tell you that infusion could be better for quantification for myocardial perfusion. So for perfusion assessment for cardiac masses, uh, you know, low MI is obviously recommended. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, yeah. It is now my privilege to introduce our second speaker, Tom Porter, MD, Chair of Cardiology and Professor of Internal Medicine, University of Nebraska Medical Center, Omaha, Nebraska. Here's Dr. Porter. Thank you very much. Um, and it's an honor to be a part of this webinar. Uh, where, as Dr. Senior just completed a very excellent presentation uh, discussing the role of ultrasound enhancing agents in Im improving our assessment of cardiac structure and function. And this uh, portion of the uh, discussion will involve uh, the assessment of myocardial perfusion. My disclosures uh, are shown here. And our agenda for this particular part uh, of the uh, webinar will be to look at the ability of the same agents that Dr. Senior just talked to you about uh, to detect myocardial perfusion and look at perfusion in other applications. And then we'll spend briefly uh, some time talking about limitations of current ultrasound systems, uh, the newer systems, the uh, matrix array systems uh, in applying these uh, ultrasound enhancing agents and how to overcome that and then some questions and hopefully some answers. Uh, I see we started having people use the Q&A option there, which is very good to start asking some questions. As Roxy pointed out, the uh, ultrasound enhancing agents are microbubbles. They're free intravascular tracers around one to two microns in diameter. They're not taken up by the myocytes, unlike uh, radionuclide uh, perfusion agents. And as very nicely described, they respond linearly and non-linearly to ultrasound. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but as uh, Dr. Senior pointed out, at a very low mechanical index, when we send those pulses of alternating amplitude or alternating phase uh, into uh, uh, a situation where we have infused or given a bolus injection of microbubbles, we get a, a nice, already robust, fundamental nonlinear response from the microbubbles. While tissue has minimal signal there, and as Roxy pointed out, can be canceled uh, uh, using the uh, pulse sequence schemes he demonstrated, so that we get a robust signal from the microbubbles at a very low mechanical index and virtually no signal from tissue. And vendors uh, have popularized both the uh, power modulation or amplitude modulation uh, pulse sequence schemes that allow us to look at fundamental nonlinear enhancement at very low mechanical indices. And uh, alternating phase and amplitude uh, signals are also uh, another nice way to elicit this fundamental nonlinear response and give us a, a large amount of contrast uh, that allows us not only to see the, the borders that uh, Dr. Senior just pointed out to you, but also the myocardial perfusion. 
And here is an example of that. Uh, here is a patient just routinely, we were doing uh, a, a bedside uh, echo in the intensive care unit, difficult to see uh, windows. When we use the uh, low MI uh, harmonic ultrasound uh, images, yes, we see nice opacification, but because we're transmitting at 1.6 megahertz and receiving at 3.2 megahertz in this particular patient, you see, as we get close to the apex in this obese patient, it's very difficult to see the basal segments, even for planimetering at endocardial border. When we push a button, literally, in this circumstance and switch over to the fundamental nonlinear response, which is transmitting at 1.8 and receiving at 1.8, we see very nicely that now we can see both the basal, mid, and distal segments of the ventricle, and now can easily planimeter a border uh, for volume assessments, as Dr. Senior pointed out. But now we can see also the myocardial contrast, the perfusion in the tissue. How do we analyze this? Well, there are basic physiologic principles that we need to know both about the the, the transducer design, uh, uh, which are physics principles, but also physiologic principles as to what we're looking at when we're looking at perfusion. Basically, when we look at myocardial perfusion, we want to see the capillary uh, blood flow and the capillary blood volume because the capillaries become the major regulator of blood flow during any form of hyperemic stress, while the arterioles tend to control uh, blood flow at uh, rest during stress. The arterials are, arterials are maximally vasodilated, and so the capillaries become the major regulator of blood flow. That is what we're seeing with the myocardial contrast enhancement. We want to, that's why we want to look at primarily close to end systolic images, because the end systolic images are when the arterials are pretty much uh, shut off, and we're purely looking at capillaries. And as nicely shown here by Kevin Way early on in his career, there was a very close correlation between end systolic myocardial contrast intensity, either expressed as, this in this case, the A value, or uh, the replenishment, as I'll talk about in a moment, the myocardial blood flow assessments uh, using the perfusion uh, uh, concepts we'll talk about in a moment, correlate very closely with myocardial blood flow measured with radio labeled microspheres. And this is what I was talking about. We give a destructive, a brief destructive impulse at a high mechanical index around 0.8 or higher, which clears the myocardium at end systole uh, or early diastole, and then analyze that replenishment. That replenishment rate is proportional to the red blood cell velocity and the plateau intensity that we see, again, using very low mechanical index imaging, it was nicely described by Dr. Senior, the plateau intensity reflects the capillary cross-sectional area that's available at that particular point in time. The velocity times the area uh, gives you myocardial blood flow with very good resolution. And when is this important? Well, this is helpful uh, both under resting circumstances in, in the situations I'll describe to you in a moment, as well as during stress imaging in the setting of rest, uh, when evaluating, for example, acute or recent chest pain in an intermediate risk patient. What do I mean by that? Well, this is an example of a patient uh, that uh, had some chest pain after having his coronaries reimplanted uh, and uh, in an aortic aneurysm repair. And as you can see here, very exquisitely, because we're using fundamental nonlinear imaging, we very nicely see the basal segment perfusion. Uh, in this patient, uh, his cor right coronary artery had become kinked, uh, and you can see there was both a wall motion abnormality and a perfusion defect. In other words, we don't see that replenishment uh, like we normally see. This is that normal replenishment pattern where you see in this patient here, uh, already at the plateau intensity, there was no replenishment here uh, because the right coronary artery had become compromised during the reimplantation of the coronary arteries in evaluating this patient with resting chest pain. And Kevin Way has looked at patients in the emergency department. This is another place where we evaluate patients with chest pain uh, who have a, a resting uh, evaluation of their wall motion typically uh, when the EKG is non-diagnostic. 
uh, as it was in this particular set of patients that analyzed in the emergency department. This was over a thousand patients that they looked at uh, who had a non-diagnostic EKGs, although they may have had some ST sigma changes that were dynamic. They looked at regional function and myocardial perfusion, RF or MP here. And they found that when both regional function and myocardial perfusion were abnormal, similar to what we saw in this patient right here, we saw both the wall motion was abnormal and the perfusion, as you can see here, was abnormal, that these patients had an almost tenfold higher risk of death or going on to non-fatal myocardial infarction within a short period of follow-up of just six weeks. So this is why looking at both regional function and myocardial perfusion, which is only possible with echocardiography. There really is no other imaging technique that allows you to simultaneously look at regional function and myocardial perfusion at the same time, just like we saw in that last patient. And when we look at a meta-analysis, this involves a meta-analysis of seven studies that looked at resting myocardial perfusion in a wide variety of different settings, either in-hospital evaluation of chest pain, emergency department evaluation of chest pain, or evaluating resting myocardial perfusion and wall motion before a stress echo in a patient referred from the emergency department or from a, a, a cardiology clinic for evaluation of chest pain. This was involving over three, almost 3,700 patients where they looked at when myocardial perfusion was abnormal or MPA and wall motion were abnormal. If both of these were abnormal, compared to patients that had normal resting myocardial perfusion and wall motion, there was a six-fold higher risk of having uh, either death or non-fatal myocardial infarction at a follow-up of about up to 2.6 years. Even when myocardial perfusion uh, uh, and wall motion were abnormal and compared to with wall motion abnormal and normal myocardial perfusion under resting conditions, again, we saw that having both of these abnormal, when compared to just one of these being abnormal, in this case, the wall motion, there was still a 1.7 fold higher risk of death or non-fatal myocardial infarction or need for urgent revascularization in this group when compared to even this group. So you can risk stratify patients by looking at both of these parameters. And as we said, only with real-time myocardial contrast echo can that be done at the bedside. Now, uh, as we said, you can look at this in two situations, uh, both uh, in the evaluation of chest pain prior to stress testing and then following urgent or semi-urgent revascularization. This is where we recommend using the very low mechanical index imaging to analyze both. Another situation where this becomes helpful is following uh, a, a patient that has had an attempt to urgently revascularize their coronary artery territory. This would be an example, the classic example of this is in this uh, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction patient who emergently gets revascularized by, by uh, emergent stent placement and has a, a good result uh, by angiographic standards, TIMI two to three flow. Now, normally we would stop there and say, okay, let's just put them on aspirin and Plavix and let's uh, put them on a beta blocker uh, because this is all we can do. Well, unfortunately, we see this a lot of times after that uh, period of revascularization period where that high mechanical index impulse is applied. This patient just had a left anterior descending uh, infarction, had emergent stent placement in the left anterior descending, had a good result by uh, angiography. But look at this. The microvasculature, the capillaries here, no reflow into this territory. This is a, a very serious outcome when we see this in patients. In that if we see that there is persistent microvascular obstruction, even after successful coronary uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, there they had almost a 60% event rate within three to four years of follow-up. Uh, and this included death, non-recurrent infarction need for defibrillator placement and heart failure. Much more frequently seen in this patient with, group with microvascular obstruction, like you saw in the previous example, when compared to a group that had normal uh, microvascular perfusion after successful uh, percutaneous coronary uh, intervention. All of these patients were considered to have great angiographic results, but the demonstration of persistent microvascular obstruction clearly identified a group that still needed some type of intervention. We don't know what that is yet, but we're hopeful we can find some answers for that in the near future. Now, during stress, 
So he said, this is another place we're looking at that microvascular perfusion is important. Again, there are basic physiologic principles uh, that we need to know about when assessing that. This is that example of that destruction replenishment curve and uh, under resting conditions uh, where we would like to see nice normal replenishment occur typically with a typical two-dimensional transducer uh, or a matrix array transducer that's operating in a two-dimensional mode. We expect that replenishment to occur in about four seconds. During any type of stress, any type of hyperemic stress, treadmill exercise, uh, vasodilator stress, or dobutamine stress, we expect that replenishment to at least double. Uh, it should definitely replenish within two seconds, if not sooner, uh, if the microvasculature is responding normally. So uh, in this country, what is often done is dobutamine uh, and exor or exercise stress, uh, and we give an infusion, for example, in this particular case, an infusion was used of an ultrasound enhancing agent. The high mechanical index impulse was applied here during a 30 microgram per kilogram per minute dobutamine infusion. And if we go back and look at those end systolic images, uh, both the wall motion and perfusion responses seem to be normal other than a basal inferior perfusion defect in this particular example. And again, early work uh, by Kevin Way uh, looking at that replenishment, which we call beta reserve here, as well as that beta reserve multiplied by the uh, plateau intensity um, in this circumstance, all show that when that uh, ratio of stress versus rest drops below two, in other words, if there isn't a doubling in that replenishment rate or uh, a doubling in that replenishment rate uh, product times the plateau intensity, uh, that is the group of patients that typically have more severe angiographic stenosis uh, and a worse microvascular function. What was interesting in this paper is that this patient this became started to become abnormal even in patients that didn't have uh, a significant stenosis, but smoked yet or had multiple risk factors. Uh, uh, the presence of just risk factors alone started to affect this uh, microvascular reserve. So this is applied day in and day out in, in our laboratory now to look at both myocardial function and flow during dobutamine or exercise stress, where we look at these end systolic images uh, to see whether capillary replenishment is occurring. You can see here that in this particular patient where wall thickening was relatively normal under resting and dobutamine stress, there was a definite perfusion defect that involved both the infralateral and apical segments uh, during dobutamine stress. And this patient had multivessel coronary artery disease despite a relatively normal wall motion response. More often than not, uh, in, uh, in this country, and I'm sure probably uh, Dr. Senior sees this in the UK as well, we see uh, patients with windows like this to start out the study. Now, before ultrasound enhancing agents, this patient would have been sent to a radionuclide stress study <laughs> because they would say, oh, we can't get any windows. But now that we have fundamental nonlinear imaging, this is that same patient uh, with fundamental nonlinear imaging uh, where we transmit and receive at the same frequency, we get exquisitely helpful from the base all the way up to the apex resting images where the replenishment here you can see was normal to here where you can see after that high mechanical index impulse, both a wall thickening and perfusion defect were evident in the distal septum apex and along this anterior lateral wall uh, again, indicating, as in this patient's case, significant multivessel coronary artery disease. In this particular case, though, where here is the resting apical three-chamber view, and here is the stressed apical three-chamber view, wall thickening remains normal during peak dobutamine stress, but there was a definite delay in replenishment. And this patient had a 90% left circumflex lesion, where wall thickening still remained normal despite uh, the development of a perfusion defect. And with any type of demand stress or, or vasodilator stress, we know that the perfusion abnormalities annotate the, the wall thickening abnormalities and help us improve our ability to detect coronary artery disease. When we look at the actual sensitivity of a perfusion and wall motion study versus a wall motion study alone, you can see the sensitivity is improved by about 20% during dobutamine stress echo. And this translates to about a 10% improvement in accuracy. Now, Dr. Senior was part of a multi-center study in Europe uh, that involved a large number of patients. 
and they compared modern day myocardial contrast echo using the real time techniques we talked about with SPECT, which is what most people, if you say, I'm doing a perfusion study today, you say, what's a perfusion study? Well, that's a nuclear study. Well, they said, well, what about perfusion with echo? This is uh, during a uh, dipyridamol stress, uh, a vasodilator stress. Uh, and they showed that in patients uh, with single vessel disease or proximal disease, the ability of myocardial contrast echo, analyzing that replenishment and analyzing that plateau intensity following a high mechanical index impulse significantly improved the sensitivity of this test in both of these critical areas. Now, sensitivity was improved across all different coronary artery territories as well, both the inferior, because again, we're transmitting and receiving at that same frequency. So we're getting good ability to look at these basal to mid segments, which are critical for analyzing these posterior circulation abnormalities. And when we look at prognosis, uh, we can look at all the different types of stresses we do today. This is a study of dobutamine stress echo done by Gianni Tsutsui and uh, San, Zhao in San Paolo, but she did this at our institution, looking at uh, what the impact of that abnormal myocardial perfusion study when it was combined with a negative wall motion response, in other words, a normal wall motion response, and compared it to when both wall motion and perfusion were abnormal. I showed you examples of both of these. Both of these patients' uh, subtypes were had significantly worse or higher death or non-fatal myocardial infarction rates when compared to a group that had normal perfusion and wall motion. And when we looked prospectively, where we randomized patients to just conventional stress echo, which is shown here in orange, and compared to this uh, purple uh, line here, which is where we combine the perfusion and wall motion assessment, we see that an abnormal study, this is the patients that had abnormal studies, the event rate was significantly higher in the group that had abnormal myocardial perfusion when compared to a, a, a group that was randomized to getting just wall motion analysis without any perfusion data added to it. So we can improve the ability of our stress imaging studies by analyzing both perfusion and wall motion. And, and Nicola Gaibazi has shown this also during dipyridamol stress echo in 1,200 patients. Again, you see a very similar pattern to what we saw with dobutamine stress. And that patients that had perfusion abnormalities alone with dipyridamol stress, and this is the high dose dipyridamol, which is 0.84 milligrams per kilogram uh, total dose. Uh, these patients, when they had perfusion defects, even in the absence of a wall motion abnormality, they still had a significantly worse event rate. But when both were abnormal, uh, you can see the event rate was much higher. Again, this is looking at hard event rates, death and non-fatal myocardial infarction at five-year follow-up. And a meta-analysis of this, of these studies has also been performed, a much larger meta-analysis. This is almost 6,000 patients uh, and, and all studies were removed where there was any duplication. So these are clearly uh, uh, patients that, that, that we're getting for uh, each study is representing uh, patients that haven't been represented twice in another study. All that bias was removed. It was almost half female. Uh, and you can see that uh, across a wide variety of, um, of, of, of different types of stressors, both dipyridamol, dobutamine, exercise, these patients, uh, when they had abnormal wall motion, did have a higher event rate, a 2.4 fold higher event rate. But when they had abnormal myocardial perfusion, the event rate was almost five fold higher. So by adding myocardial perfusion to wall motion, you improve the predictive value of your stress echo. And it's highly recommended that, you, uh, that this technique be combined to improve our stress echo techniques. And why might that be important? Well. Because our current radionuclide spec studies that use attenuation correction still have very poor resolution, only 10 to 11 millimeters spatial resolution. So you could clearly be missing a subendocardial perfusion defect. The gating of these studies to look at wall motion is very poor. It's eight frames per beat. And it's not done simultaneously with perfusion like we do with echo. It's looked at separately. Uh, and as a time-dependent tracer, it's, uh, it clearly is uh, 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 where we wash out as, or excuse me, the half-life is affecting how much you're seeing in terms of uptake, plus you're giving the patient a dose of radiation, and it can't be done at bedside. With very low mechanical index imaging, you're looking at both wall motion and perfusion. 
you have excellent spatial resolution. And Dr. Senior has looked at specific patient populations where that may be very important. We know there's a lot of septal thinning in left bundle branch block. Patients that come in with acute cardiomyopathy have thinned uh, uh, segments. Um, and if you're using a, something that has this type of resolution, you will have problems with partial volume artifacts because you're not sampling just the septum, you're sampling parts of the adjacent cavity as well. And this is especially true in left bundle branch block where he showed that we can improve the sensitivity of our ability to detect coronary artery disease in left bundle branch blocks if we use perfusion echo over perfusion spec. And again, you're getting this without any radiation. Uh, yeah, there's no time sensitivity to the microbubbles. You can reassess a region two or three times if you want with a flash replenishment curve, and it can be done at bedside. So we think this is the most beneficial technique for looking at perfusion today. We definitely need to get the word out so that we can improve our ability to detect coronary disease and uh, improve prognostic capabilities. But as Roxy pointed out, we needed some new guidelines. And uh, going into this, the second part of this talk uh, here to, uh, uh, because the new platforms uh, developed by industry uh, created some problems. Uh, these 3D matrix array transducers now, we don't have any of the S51 transducers anymore. The, the two-dimensional transducers, we have 3D matrix array transducers. Uh, and uh, that uh, creates some more noise in the images for contrast enhanced protocols. Plus, we need protocols for a wide variety of settings. Uh, Dr. Senior pointed out some of those. Uh, and there are lots of off-label indications that people are using this for that need uh, some form of protocol to go with them. One of those being uh, situations like carotid artery evaluations, where we can look at not only plaque, but also the perfusion of the plaque, aortic aneurysms. Dr. Senior showed you a brilliant example of that uh, with the uh, pseudo aneurysm. Uh, and endovascular graphs, which are being used quite frequently uh, now to uh, assess uh, the patency, uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. This was a bolus injection of an ultrasound enhancing agent that was given here. Uh, although the angiogram in this patient where uh, they had put the endograft in uh, did not demonstrate any uh, uh, endo leaks. Remember, this is the endo leaks are the biggest problem uh, following the endograft placement. Uh, a, a type 2 endoleak was evident here uh, with contrast in Hunt's ultrasound that was coming from the lumbar artery in this uh, aortic endograph. A typical a problem here is the lumbar artery giving off the, endo, the, um, uh, the perfusion to this area within the sac of the aneurysm. So again, this is an area where very low mechanical index imaging uh, because it exquisitely detects um, uh, the uh, bubbles uh, can be very useful for detecting uh, uh, the uh, endograft leaks. Also, we know Doppler signals. We routinely now, uh, and anybody getting contrast, we also try to repeat our assessment of the tricuspid regurgitant of jet. Uh, and there are times where uh, at least three times a day where the tricuspid jet without contrast is very difficult to see, uh, but the patient is getting contrast to get better endocardial border resolution. Uh, or to assess perfusion. At the end of the study, uh, when they've done all those uh, primary indications, uh, our sonographers now routinely uh, just say, well, there's a little bit of contrast left. You don't need a whole lot of contrast in there. You can go at a lower rate of infusion. You reduce the gain settings and you can really pick up a lot of tricuspid regurgion and jets that were not detectable without uh, uh, in an unenhanced study. Uh, and as Roxy pointed out, the new guidelines that we uh, put together allow us to better uh, assess uh, at the, uh, and uh, have some uh, points of reference uh, for making sure we quantify LV volumes and injection fraction, uh, not to sound like a, uh, a repeating uh, record here. Again, to get complete opacification of the entire LV for volume assessments and regional wall motion, as you can see in this example, and Rock just showed another example, you really need the very low mechanical index imaging, fundamental nonlinear to uh, better delineate these borders. Uh, and at the American College of Cardiology, uh, uh, this upcoming session will uh, hopefully prevent, uh, present to you what the normal ranges should be because it's clearly different than what the current guidelines give us for normal volume assessments uh, in terms of what uh, a normal range should be. Um, and the normal range with the very low mechanical index imaging 
uh, as Roxy pointed out, correlates much better with MRI uh, and more accepted measures of volume assessment. Now, so we said uh, the, the uh, new transducers um, have created some new problems for us, more noise. Uh, and uh, although we still find the fundamental nonlinear uh, concept to still work, the matrix array transducers uh, tend to have more far field attenuation, uh, but a lot more noise in the image. So we've actually uh, recommend now that we, uh, on the current guidelines uh, that Roxy referred to earlier, uh, we move this mechanical index down to 0.1 to 0.14 to reduce some of the noise in the systems. If you use the, uh, the previous uh, recommended assessments of 0.16 to 0.18, you tend to sometimes get more noise uh, in the image. We still recommend, uh, unless you really want to see the apex better, to put the focus behind the mitral annulus uh, and continue to use the low frequency uh, transmit settings. With that being said, uh, it is still very nice uh, uh, with the matrix array transducers uh, that you can get uh, complete unattenuated alveol pacification with a bolus or a continuous infusion. Uh, and whether you're doing stress uh, for LVO with LVO or with perfusion, uh, these uh, uh, modifications uh, help. Uh, uh, Dr. Senior again pointed out to you uh, basically how the different agents uh, are recommended to be mixed. Uh, and uh, as you know, we use the Devilamix for Definity, and you can use it for 12 hours after uh, warming it. Uh, but again, it's recommended you hand agitate it before reuse for Lumison and Sonaview, uh, or Sonaview, excuse me, uh, it has a self-assembly. Um, and in Europe, uh, you have the Vuject pump uh, for administration, uh, which we don't have in this country, uh, but uh, is available for make, keeping that uh, uh, infusion maintained should you want to use an infusion. Uh, and Optison is already formulated uh, and is drawn into a syringe with an 18 gauge needle. Uh, and again, both the 2018 guidelines and the uh, updated uh, ECHO Research and Practice uh, CE or, or ICUS guidelines, again, recommend fundamental nonlinear imaging and these uh, different uh, dosing schemes are recommended uh, for uh, Definity, for Optison, uh, and uh, this was written before Lumison was approved in the United States. That's why that's not included here, but it is included in the um, uh, current uh, ECHO research and practice guidelines uh, for bolus dosing. Uh, we recommend just a little bit lower dose for Definity and 0.3 to 0.5 mils for Lumison and Optison. And it was, as was pointed out by Roxy, a slow, I'm reiterating a lot of the concepts Roxy put in here because these are very important for bolus injections that if you're going to use those, use a low dose uh, first. You can always go higher. I like that uh, endograft example I showed you, they actually gave about 2.5 mils to get an endograft higher uh, it, it, because that was in a peripheral vasculature. But if you're using it for a cardiac application, you'll probably want to start with a low dose of Lumison or Optison or Definity. Uh, and you can always give more, but you want to avoid that attenuation that was very nicely showed by uh, Dr. Senior uh, by giving a lower dose and then a slow five to 10 millimeters flush over 10 seconds uh, so that you pre pre uh, prevent the shadowing. And again, using fundamental nonlinear imaging uh, to reduce attenuation. Uh, these, again, I won't go over these in detail again, but these are very important. Uh, for uh, reducing the risk with bolus injections of getting attenuation uh, and which basically you're just wasting a period of time for yourself if you give too much. So start low, you can always go higher. Uh, and if you're doing it during stress imaging, uh, bolus should be given right 30 seconds before exercise termination. And then at, during pharmacologic stress, as you know, you can give it during different stages of the pharmacologic stress. Uh, and uh, for an endograft study or a peripheral vascular study, you may need more uh, for a bolus injection. Like I told you, that example I showed you there was 2.5 mil injection of, of uh, Lumison. Continuous infusions have the advantage uh, of not creating, uh, you know, the kind of bolus artifacts that occur with attenuation. Uh, it's best to uh, mix the uh, vial, half of the vial with, of either the agent in 20 to 30 mils of 0.9% normal saline, and then infuse to where you get that homogeneous LVO pacification. Again, recommended fundamental nonlinear imaging if you have it available to you and constantly mix the solution as you're infusing it. Uh, and again, to look at perfusion, whether it be a bolus or continuous infusion, 
you want your high mechanical index impulse to clear the myocardium uh, and, and minimize LV cavity uh, destruction because that allows you to look at both regional wall motion and perfusion. And as Dr. Senior pointed out, this is the same concept. Should you see a cardiac mass uh, that you would use uh, for evaluating that mass, just like you would for the myocardium, uh, because different masses have different replenishment characteristics after that high mechanical index impulse. You can see here a thrombus has virtually no replenishment, as you might suspect, as an avascular structure. Uh, like you would see out here, uh, while normal myocardium has uh, a definite replenishment pattern. So if you look at this particular case here, a personal short axis view uh, and a patient uh, presenting uh, with a, a history of syncope, uh, and you see this large mass here in uh, the right atrium. This is short axis view, aortic valve here, RVOT here. So we see this mass in the right atrium and we uh, give the replenishment and look at those periods of time following a high mechanical index impulse. You can see here we've cleared uh, the myocardium uh, and the uh, mass of any uh, possible perfusion. And over a period of time, you see by four seconds, there's some replenishment of that mass, uh, but it's a heterogeneous pattern, uh, which would be consistent of a benign tumor, which in this case turned out to be a myxoma. That being said, you may have one last question. You say, well, are there any uh, serious adverse reactions with giving ultrasound enhancing agents? Well, uh, it is very rare. Uh, you do need to realize that there's a one and maybe 10,000 risk uh, that a patient may have a serious respiratory event um, in response to an ultrasound enhancing agent and the lab personnel should be trained for that, but it is very rare. Uh, we have re-looked at 54,378 patients uh, since 2018, both before and after COVID, uh, any kind of side effect at all occurred in about 0.5%, and almost all that was some back pain that resolved with time. So it is extremely safe, uh, but uh, it's important to just act, make sure the patient hasn't any known prior hypersensitivity uh, to an ultrasound enhancing agent and have resuscitation equip equipment available to you uh, in your echo lab. But to conclude, uh, uh, this portion of the webinar, uh, we recommend uh, both for the structural applications and for perfusion imaging and for evaluation of any of the, the off-label uh, indications that fundamental nonlinear imaging be used uh, with a very low mechanical index imaging. Uh, exceptions are, as Roxy put it out, if you're trying to look for non-compaction, uh, there you may want to go to a higher mechanical index imaging so that you do destroy uh, the the uh, muscular uh, protrusions um, and allows you to see those intertrabecular recesses uh, and better define the non-compaction to compaction ratio. There, you're purposely trying uh, to go a little higher in my to destroy the myocardial contrast and delineate the trabeculations. But other applications where you're trying to get a, a good look at that compacted border uh, and make volume assessments, make regional wall motion assessments, fundamental nonlinear imaging is indispensable in that circumstance. So for both on-label and off-label applications, whether it be an inadequate window or you need to assess a quantitative LBEF, uh, you need, if a chest pain a patient, you need to look at regional wall motion. We recommend this because not only can you get good regional wall motion analysis, but you can look at perfusion and wall motion simultaneously. And then any other application as pointed out here, and as we just discussed, these uh, all work best with fundamental nonlinear imaging, whether using a bolus or a continuous infusion of the enhancing agent. With that, I will uh, stop there and we will uh, allow for some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Porter. Uh, and I do see that we do have some questions there in the Q&A. Uh, those of you that have held off uh, as you've been uh, listening to the presentations of uh, Dr. Senior and Dr. Porter, uh, please go ahead and find that Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. Click on that button. You'll be able to uh, type in your questions. Roxy, I think you get question one there. It says, can you do Simpson's biplane measurement on an LV that has been opacified? Or how did you get an EF of 42% in your example after using contrast? You have to unmute there. 
Yeah, I think the, the reason for uh, uh, injecting a contrast uh, is to delineate the endocardial borders so that you can quantitate uh, LV ejection fraction in a more robust way. So uh, it, it is, it is uh, you know, all machines have uh, a way to planimeter the borders. So with contrast, you planimeter the border between the endocardium and the, you know, bright, uh, and the bright signal. And uh, in the four chamber, in the two chamber, and you get your Simpsons uh, uh, result. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do it in 3D uh, with contrast. I think, it, it, you know, we did have an algorithm uh, performing it before. I think initially it was being developed, but suddenly it seemed not to have taken off after that. Uh, but with 2D, there shouldn't be any difficulty in quantitating with contrast. Uh, you know, if, if there's a confusion about 3D and 2D, that's why I brought in 3D. The next question is, is there a role for contrast in coronary vessel imaging? That's a, uh, a very interesting question. Uh, I can take a stab at it first and then Roxy yeah. would have some comments too. We, uh, we don't directly visualize the coronary arteries uh, because of the resolution it needs to be around 0.6 uh, millimeters for that. And we're not quite that good with transthoracic imaging, but um, there has been a considerable amount of uh, contrast enhancement use in uh, the Doppler assessment of the left anterior descending. Uh, and that has provided a lot of prognostically helpful information. And we in the United States, unfortunately, don't do that very often. I know in Italy, it's done quite a lot. Uh, and maybe Roxy could comment uh, uh, if they use utilize uh, the left anterior descending um, uh, Doppler coordinate flow reserve measurements uh, and how often you use contrast for that if you do do that. Yeah, no, um, unfortunately, we don't do, uh, uh, you know, Doppler uh, um, assessment of the LAD for velocity ratio um, uh, because, I mean, it's, it's a very useful tool, of course. You know, you get a, you get, you get a sense of coronary flow reserve uh, in, in, in that particular territory, but because it's not actually giving us a quantification of the myocardium the, as a whole, um, but it has been shown to predict outcome, Tom, you know, there are plenty of data showing that it, it does pr uh, predict uh, prognosis uh, and it is, it can be useful in patients with microvascular disease, uh, because it gives you a sense of, uh, a, a, a coronary flow reserve, which is a marker of, uh, microvascular disease. But in, in day-to-day -day clinical practice, um, uh, you know, even if you have a flow, uh, 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 a coronary reduction in uh, flow reserve, but if there's no perfusion abnormality, and if there is no ischemia, uh, you, you don't change, you, you know, it's difficult to change patient's management under those circumstances. Um, I mean, you can tell the patient that you've got a low, you know, flow reserve, uh, uh, you have to be careful, look after risk factors, but we'll be doing that anyway. Uh, so I think the usefulness of that technique comes in in patients where the coronary arteries are completely normal and you have reduction in coronary flow reserve, but there also myocardial perfusion helps a lot because you can look at uh, actually ischemia. You know, you're actually detecting perfusion abnormality in the myocardium. And therefore, like you've shown in your study, that you, you, you know, it's um, in presence with normal coronary arteries, if you demonstrate ischemia, it is ischemia, you know, in non-obstructive disease, and it has got prognostic outcome and diagnostic outcome. So if you're using, if you're using contrast already, and uh, if you are looking at myocardial perfusion, uh, you can also assess coronary flow reserve, you know, you can quantitate coronary flow reserve. So that's the reason why I don't see any, uh, uh, you know, extra benefit in, in Doppler uh, uh, you know, uh, assessment for uh, velocity ratio, but those who are not using, looking at perfusion, for them maybe, you know, that would give another handle of looking at prognosis rather than diagnosis. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a very good point because I, uh, what Dr. Senior was referring to was studies that uh, we have done looking at patients that had not obstructive coronary disease, but still had inducible uh, microvascular perfusion defects uh, during dopamine or exercise stress echo, 
And we found that a lot of those patients kind of went down the wrong pathway after they had gotten the heart catheterization. They were basically not treated uh, with the risk factor modification uh, therapies and their mortality was just as high as the group that did have obstructive coronary disease when we followed them for three years. So we've become a lot more aggressive both here and the cath lab has become a lot more aggressive uh, in looking invas for invasive hemodynamics uh, at patients that have abnormalities that we detect uh, with a perfusion that they don't see any coronary obstructive disease. And I found that almost over 95% of the time where they see either no or minimally obstructive coronary disease, when they measure hyperemic microvascular resistance, over 90% of the time, they see abnormalities in the microvascular resistance on their invasive measurements that were detected with the perfusion echo. And uh, now, again, what happens with these patients, uh, as Dr. Senior pointed out, you can uh, uh, probably assess uh, them and at least put them on aggressive risk factor modification therapy. I suspect these are the patients that were like in the Scott Park trial where they looked at coronary CTA, uh, where they saw non-obstructive disease and found that they also had a higher uh, risk when they detected plaque, even though it was not obstructive, uh, that we're probably seeing the microvascular abnormalities uh, in those patients uh, before they develop anything significant by angiography. I have a question, I guess, while we're waiting for some additional questions for uh, uh, Dr. Senior. I, 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 have you continued to uh, look at the, I noticed you published more on the left bundle branch block patients. We see more and more, it seems like, uh, patients coming to us for stress echocardiography with left bundle branch block. And we see a wide variety of ejection fractions in these uh, patients. Um, that's And uh, they have the classic uh, septal flash and uh, apical rocking motion and the perfusion uh, again, seems to be very helpful in these patients, um, but you can see how thin the, the septum becomes in these patients. Uh, uh, if you're, uh, are you doing any ongoing work in these patients uh, right now to, to uh, further assess them or risk stratify them? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So we actually conducted, uh, so, so we first published a paper uh, with perfusion, as you uh, alluded, uh, Tom, uh, comparing with SPECT, et cetera, and of course, uh, Michael contrast echo was much uh, superior because of the reasons that we've stated. Uh, and then what we did is we said, okay, you know, at that time we were not regularly performing perfusion for left one branch block during dobutamine or exercise. And uh, so the study that we did was with vasodilator. And when we uh, looked at our data, just looking at wall motion, uh, during stress, the wall motion score index, which is an in indication of LV function during stress, which includes both ischemia and underlying LV dysfunction that the patient might have, uh, it did give us a prognostic data. Uh, a meaning, you know, if the, if the wall motion uh, score index is better than the prognosis was good, if it's worse, it's bad. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's not a, um, um, it's a no-brainer to know that. But what we discovered is our pickup of coronary disease was very poor. So mm. when there's wall motion abnormality, we were right in only 50% of the time that there's coronary disease because the wall motion is very difficult to assess and we overcall wall thickening abnormality because of left one branch block. So it's not a good way of actually saying that the patient has got coronary disease. Then what we said is, okay, we know that perfusion works. So we use perfusion in 170 patients. Uh, uh, and so we, it's a simultaneous wall motion and perfusion assessment. And we made it a point that we'll only call the wall motion, um, uh, you know, uh, we'll call it ischemic. If there is concomitant perfusion defect, if there's no perfusion, we will not call it ischemic. And the in the first instance, we look at our, uh, data for diagnosis of coronary disease. And, uh, and what we found is that in, so we did it in 166 patients of which uh, 30 patients showed ischemia based on perfusion. And these patients underwent coronary angiography and 90% of the time they had coronary disease. Wow. 
So wow. it improved our diagnostic assessment definitely. So now we are looking at outcome. So we are now collecting data for outcome. That's very interesting data. Thank you for sharing that because again, uh, we really see uh, it's a very good to always point out to the fellows the, the what the left bundle branch block does to a, a radionuclide stress study. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone's abnormal, uh, and here where you have that ability to discriminate uh, with the resolution we have uh, for. Uh, perfusion to see truly where is the true perfusion abnormality and that close correlation with angiography. Very interesting data. So, and uh, one the last question I think we have time for here is uh, what with vasodilator stress, should you counteract the effect of adenosine, regodenosine with aminophilin at the end of the study? Uh, we don't do a vasodilator stress here other than nuclear. Nuclear does a lot of the vasodilator stress, uh, stress and Yes, we have used that when there's a complication, but usually these are such short duration effects with either of these agents that uh, it's rare that we have to do that. I don't know what your experience has been, Roxy. Yeah, so we uh, uh, we tend to use diperdamol, the higher dose, you know, 0.84, uh, uh, for uh, assessing perfusion in patients who cannot exercise or who have problems with dobutamine, or if it's a non-diagnostic study with dobutamine, you know, the patient didn't achieve target heart rate, felt unwell, so we revert to vasodilator stress. So there we do give aminophylline as a routine because we know that the effect of diapridamol uh, uh, does last even up to 24 hours and right. the patient can feel unwell at home. So we prophylactically give aminophylline in those patients before they uh, leave the lab. With diperdamol, uh, we don't use adenosine. For regadenosine or for, well, you don't use regadenosine then? Okay, or? so we do use regadenosine, but um, uh, but we don't use as much as diperdamol. The only reason is uh, uh, till late, regadenosine has been very expensive for us <laughs> compared to diperdamol. <laughs> uh, so we stuck to diperdamol. But lately it appeared since Brexit, things have turned around. Uh, the diperdamol has become very expensive. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so we might go for regadenosin if it is cheaper or even if it is equal, because it's easier. Of course, you give a bolus and just yes, get the, right. yeah. But do you give much a uh, uh, M for regadenosin? Um, it depends, actually. So we, uh, after regadenosin, if the patient is uh, you know is fine, there's no symptom, we don't because it's a short half life, right? It goes away after right, ten right, minutes. Right everything uh, reverts to normal. But if the patient feels unwell and have a bit of, you know, uh, bronchospasm or something, then we say, okay, let's give some amenophilin to combat that. So it's less than maybe 10% of your... Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's, it's not, it, it's low. That's why we don't routinely give it. While with diperdamol, we routinely give it. 